Now, in addition to you know, backing Middle Eastern regimes with security assistance and other aid, some U.S. embassy staffers you know, did have uh, and, and, and do have uh, sporadic contacts with pro-democracy activists in Arab countries. And some congressionally funded foundations, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, you know, have um, even provided some you know, limited uh, um, financial support for certain um, um, uh, uh, projects uh, in terms of, you know, so, of uh, for various civil society organizations, uh, particularly in Egypt. But the small amount of democracy assistance um, traditionally has gone to elite opposition groups, not the more radical grassroots um, organizations that led the resistance to the U.S. Uh, 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 backed uh, uh, dictatorships. Uh, the, um, in fact, a number of them refused USA on principle. Um, and, and none of this aid or assistance or, or workshops or whatever involved um, uh, training in strategic nonviolent action or other forms of grassroots mobilization that, that, that proved so decisive. In any case, you know, the amount of money through NED and whatever paled in comparison to the um, billions of dollars of aid, $70 billion in aid to, to, to Mubarak, for example, in the past 30 years. Um, and, and the close and regular cooperation between U.S. Uh, political and military officials and the Egyptian government. In fact, uh, Obama largely cut off the uh, support for these democracy assistance programs uh, soon after he came to office. So um, again, I want to emphasize that the uh, U.S. Uh, does not deserve the credit or the blame, depending on one's perspective, uh, for, for what uh, tran transpired. Um, in fact, just a little footnote, I mentioned Kafaya earlier, uh, they boycotted, uh, they, uh, to Obama's credit, he invited some uh, opposition representatives to his uh, speech in the University of Cairo, but Kafaya refused. They turned down the invitation saying, we want, uh, we want action, not, not just words. Um, now, I also want to emphasize, I want to talk a little bit about, about the, the role of the internet. There's been a lot of um, talk about the role of Facebook in particular. And uh, certainly social media helped expose the abuses of the regime and uh, helped, helped get around the censorship. And during the revolt, it helped with tactical coordination of protests. But I think it, it's a mistake to overemphasize it, I think, as some people have. For one thing, less than 15% of the Egyptian population has access to internet. And most of that is through internet cafes that are heavily policed. Um, and during that critical five-day period early in the uprising when there was no internet, that's when the um, movement grew the most, most dramatically. In fact, uh, in, in certain ways, the, the shutdown helped the movement, uh, both because a, a lot of people were upset that they uh, lost their internet service, but also um, people wanting to know what was going on in the streets couldn't find out the internet, so they went out to check it out themselves and got swept up in the protest. And parents worried about their kids couldn't get, get through to them on, and, and through cell phones, whatever, so they came out and, and joined and, and may have actually uh, helped uh, uh, lead to, to, uh, to greater, greater numbers. And so on balance, while well, the internet was, was, was helpful, um, it, it, it was, I don't think it was necessary. I mean, when you think of all these, um, the Eastern, uh, Eastern European revolutions, 89, that was before there was internet, and similarly in many, most of the Latin American, Southeast Asian, African uh, countries. Uh, Mali, which uh, had a, a successful nonviolent struggle against the Traore regime in 1991, word of their movement spread uh, using griots, you know, the traditional sing-songy storytellers going from village to village. Um, you know, so so my, my point here is that if, um, if, if people are committed to a struggle, they're going to find a way to communicate one way or the other. And yeah, the internet is a very useful tool, but again, I don't want to fall into this idea, oh, Western technology comes and saves the day or whatever, that this is, uh, again, uh, you know, not to, to let's just, that, let's, um, um, I think one way or the other, uh, the uh, people of Egypt, Tunisia, and, and these other struggles would find other ways to, to get their word out. Uh, and and I, similarly, the WikiLeaks thing. Um, I mean, yes, leak cables exposed how U.S. diplomats were aware of the corruption and repression of these respective regimes and, and the propensity of these regimes to exaggerate the influence of radical Islamists among the opposition. Uh, but this was, nothing new, uh, this was nothing new to the people 
of Tunisia and Egypt. I mean, they knew all this already. They didn't need WikiLeaks to, to, to tell them. Um, I also want to, uh, to, to, uh, to mention that this is, you know, there have been some reports about um, the, uh, the, um, the role of outsiders in um, uh, training and assistance to the, the nonviolent struggles. There were a couple seminars um, organized by Egyptian pro-democracy groups that brought in veterans of popular unarmed insurrections in uh, Serbia, South Africa, and Palestine, um, along with some Western academics who had studied the phenomenon. But these seminars uh, focused on generic information about the history and dynamics of strategic nonviolent struggle, not on how to overthrow Mubarak. Um, Neither the uh, foreign speakers or their affiliate institutions uh, provide any training, advice, money, or anything tangible you know, to the um, small number of Egyptian activ um, activists that, 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 that attended. And, uh, and I, I know, because I was one of these academics that was there, uh, the M. Khaldun Center in late 2007, in, in the most important of these uh, seminars. And, um, I can vouch that the Egyptians present were already very knowledgeable and sophisticated in terms of strategic thinking about the struggle. None of us foreigners can take credit uh, for what later transpired. Um, neither the Egyptians nor the Tunisians needed a Lawrence of Arabia type figure from the West to come in and, and you know, organize their revolt. Um, and you know, the writings of Gene Sharp, you know, translated into Arabic, you know, were, were useful, but only in the way that Clausewitz or Lao or somebody would be, you know, uh, you know, useful for uh, someone looking at, uh, you know, military, um, you know, strategy. Again, get some general concepts, you know, which and 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 wait and, and encourage people to think, perhaps, in certain conceptual frameworks that were useful. But that's very, very different than actually organizing and thinking uh, on specific strategies and tactics that were needed, which in both Tunisia and Egypt were brilliant and were innovative and were, and some of them were new, never seen before in any other kind of uprising like this. So I think that's, uh, that we really need to, again, not deny agency <laughs> to the uh, Egyptian um, um, people themselves. They had the courage and smarts to fight for their own liberation and, um, and uh, let's, let's not deny that, uh, that, 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 uh, that to them. Um, one thing, that's, one thing that's been exciting about what we've seen, I, I think, so far, is uh, that it strikes, all this strikes a blow to the two extremes in this uh, nearly decade-long battle between uh, Islamic extremists and, and U.S. imperialists. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda's line for years was that, you know, the only way to overthrow these Western-backed, you know, dictatorships is through subscribing, you know, to their, um, their cult, basically, their... <laughs> Um, uh, you know their their extreme ideology and, and use of terrorism, but you know they have um, you know, their first attack, as some of you may know, against uh, U.S. interest was the um, um, Kobar Tower bombing in, in, in Riyadh in 1995, where uh, it was a residential compound for Americans who were training the Saudi National Guard, which was largely for internal repression. Um, but you know they they haven't come close to overthrowing any. Western-backed dictators. Um, on the um, on the other extreme, uh, the line put forward by American neoconservatives and their supporters: the only way to bring democracy in the Middle East is it has to be imposed by the West, um, you know, as we've seen in, uh, um, in Iraq, and we all know how well that's worked. Um, you know, uh, I mean, Iraq today we have pro-democracy groups. Raided and shut down, intellectuals, journalists, and other supporters of the nonviolent protests they had there uh, arrested, uh, tortured. You see rigged elections, government backed death squads. Um, Transparency International ranks the government as one of the most corrupt on the planet. Um, again, uh, that, you know, that's not what democracy looks like. <laughs> um, and it's ironic, some of the people most skeptical of the nonviolent pro democracy struggle in. in, in um, Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen and Bahrain and elsewhere are the very ones who support the invasion of Iraq. Um, and uh, you know, they, they claim that, uh, the, I mean, indeed, the claim that uh, the invasion brought democracy to Iraq is, 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 is almost as big a lie as the claim they had weapons of mass destruction. Um, the, um, 
What's been really uh, exciting, I think, about the, um, uh, these, these movements is, is indeed the very, the very indigenous you know, nature of, of what has, has happened. Uh, and, and frankly, I don't believe that Iraq was even about democracy. I think it was, it was, um, much, it was uh, um, had about as much to do with democracy as the uh, Sports Illustration swimsuit issue has to do about advertising swimwear. Um, this is, um, <clears throat> indeed, I think, uh, frankly, Bush did for democracy in the Middle East what uh, Stalin did for socialism in Eastern Europe. Um, you, know, you know, gave it a bad name, gave it, a, you know, uh, made it synonymous with um, uh, occupation and, and, and repression and, uh, and, and, and loss, of, loss of sovereignty. And, and I think what, you know, um, so we're really seeing a, a whole new paradigm here that I think uh, is, is a great hope uh, that, that um, something that's, 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 uh, that's uh, authentic and indigenous and it, it um, in many ways follows a trend that we've seen over the years. Freedom House uh, uh, actually had a survey that looked at, uh, came out, you know, I think four years ago, four or five years ago, that looked at um, 70 countries that, that up to that point had made the transition from dictatorship to some form of democracy. And they, they found that um, um, you know, there were some cases where a government uh, made that transition using uh, you know, the elites voluntarily ceded power. Uh, and there were uh, some cases of successful armed revolution, H hardly any, I think just one or two through external uh, intervention. The vast majority, close to three quarters of them in fact, were from civil society organizations engaged in strategic uh, nonviolent action. Um, and uh, in, um, in a different study uh, published in 2007 in the journal International Security, and this is actually going to be a, come out as a book in a couple months uh, by uh, um, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, uh, they had used an expanded database, so it analyzed in 323 uh, major insurrections in support of uh, self-determination, democratic rule in the past hundred years, and found that violent resistance was successful only 24% uh, um, of the time, whereas nonviolent campaigns had a 53% uh, uh, chance of success. In other words, more than twice as likely uh, to succeed. Um, so, you know, from the, so what we're seeing in the Middle East is what we've seen from the poorest countries of Africa to relatively affluent countries in Eastern Europe, from communist regimes to right-wing military dictatorships, really across the cultural and ideological and geographic spectrum. Um, the, in, 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 in certain ways, I, mean, I think the, you know, the stereotype we have in the West is, oh, you know, the Arab world, uh, they're uh, much more into, uh, in Islamic countries, and you know, they're much more into the collective than the individual, and therefore they're more tolerant of authoritarian regimes. But uh, as many of you know, uh, Islam also has an implied social contract. Yes, you're supposed to obey the ruler if the rule is just, um, if they are you know, following the will of God, but if they are unjust, you have no obligation to obey them. In fact, if anything, you have an obligation to, to um, refuse to cooperate. And we see this in Hadith, we see this in early caliphs, I and mean, this is, you know, Islamic scholars have long recognized uh, the, the right to, uh, to not cooperate with illegitimate authority. And this non-cooperation, of course, is the whole cornerstone of strategic nonviolent action. Um, and there's this great, uh, uh, there's quite a history in the Middle East. Uh, we can talk and look at the 1919 uh, independence struggle in, in Egypt, uh, which ended formal colonial rule. Iran has had a long history of, of such uprisings, going back to the tobacco strike in the 1890s and other resistance, uh, resistance against other concessions, the 1906 constitutional revolution, the overthrow of the Shah uh, in 1979, uh, and the, the aborted Green Revolution um, in 2009. Um, Palestine, you know, saw the general strikes in the 1930s, the first intifada, which was overwhelmingly uh, nonviolent, more recent campaigns against uh, the wall and Solomon construction in the West Bank. Uh, in Sudan, uh, military dictatorships in both 1964 and 1985 were, were, uh, were ousted, uh, though unfortunately these countries slid back into uh, dictatorships um, a few years later. Uh, but you know, after they were thrown to marry in 1985, for four years, Sudan was probably the most democratic country in the Arab world. Um, the uh, 2006 uh, Cedar Revolution in Lebanon ended years of Syrian uh, domination. Uh, 1905, sorry, 19, 19, 2005, uh, Cedar Revolution 
uh, ended um, years of Syrian domination in that country. Uh, there's also been an ongoing nonviolent struggle in the occupied Western Sahara against the uh, uh, Moroccan uh, occupation uh, there. So, you know, there's a, um, the, the Middle East, in many ways, this is not totally new, though obviously the scope is, uh, is, is on a, a qualitatively um, higher level. And, 